With a new story of charter deportee flights reaching across the world, we invited attorney at law, John Bassey, and head of the JCF's Corporate Communications Unit, Senior Superintendent Stephanie Lindsay, to help us better understand the process of deportation, and not only deportation, but what happens when we um, receive our deportees here and what happens um, after that. Good morning, morning to you both. Thank morning. you for being morning. here. Morning. Um, so let's, let's, let's start with the stats, Senior Super. We're just talking about that during the break. Approximately, roughly, around 1,500-ish. 1,200,000, 1, there about. A annually. thousand, between 1,000 and... And 1,200. There are some years when you will see more, depends on what is happening. So we get that number. Most of the persons, um, and we don't refer to them as deportees, they are involunt involuntary returned migrants. Gotcha. That's the appropriate terminology. Involuntary. For the police. Involuntary Return. returned migrants. For the police. So that's the official term. That's the official term. Knowledge that's used for them. Mm -hmm. So, and the bulk of those are for immigration-related matters, okay. overstaying and so on. Um, and most of them would come from where? Most of the persons are from the United States. Okay. And most, you say, come because of immigration issues? Most of them are immigration issues. From, from different countries, we have them. So like last year, we saw where the US was number one. Then we have Canada. We also had the, the Bahamas and, and, and then the, the so UK. The UK and what, then last the UK. Week? Yes, so. So, Basi, do do. We have a notion, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, where we tend to label every involuntary return migrant as a really horrible criminal who is just born to a rate of recidivism and will never become a good person again. Is that, is that fair? Is that... Well, it's not necessarily really fair, to be quite honest with you. Um, with the UK, I can speak to the UK, there are two types of removal. You have the administrative removal, which is really called forced removal, and it normally speaks to a person who has no, no more time left in England. There's no more leave to remain there. And then, of course, you have the de deportation, Deportation speaks to where a person has, in fact, gone to a criminal sentence for 12 months or longer and has to be removed by a deportation notice. So they're two different things. And you may find the former may not necessarily be a person who Correct. is bad or incorrect. Right, but we tend to lump everybody. Right. Well, can I get your thoughts on, on the, the most recent, what of the UK? A um, lot of controversy surrounding that. Yes. Um, my personal thoughts are, if you put yourself in their position, You've never lived in Jamaica for more than a few years. You're being returned a deportation order. You've served your time, and I'm not sure all cases are the same, but you've, you've served your time, you're returning. It's almost like double jeopardy. And um, Diane Abbott, shadow minister, that said that several times over. When this occurs, it's like double jeopardy. Double jeopardy being you're paying twice. You're paying same. twice for the same crime. Mm -hmm. yep. Superintendent, um, you already said that most of them are for immigration. Just following up with what Sim just asked, the 17 who came, he said three persons convicted of robbery and firearm among the 17. They were convicted of rape, violent crimes, drug offenses, the combined sentence length of 75 years, as well as a life sentence. What happens when that person who got a life sentence, if he's here, he probably didn't serve his full time, because life sentence means mm -hmm. life. What happens when he comes? Is he just a, a free citizen like myself? Yes, because there's a process. So once we get the information that persons will be coming, then this, they will check our local system to see if person, if they were, if we have any interest in them. Because there are some persons who go abroad because they are run away from our um, justice right. system. So if they fall into that category, upon return, would have an interest in them. Otherwise, if they have served their time overseas, no matter the seriousness of the offense, when they come to Jamaica, they go through this processing, they check fingerprints, they check identity, because sometimes they are sent back under a different name than the names we have, so we go through that. But after that process is done, then there is no monitoring. They are free citizens. Yeah, Mr. Bassi said usually they do their time. I repeat, it's a life sentence. Obviously, he didn't do his time. So is, is he a special case or no? No, not a special case. Once they are sent back, that's it. That's it. So how do you feel about how we deal with, with these gentlemen and women who are sent back home? What is the process? They come? They come in a bag? Well... They, they're just... Well, let me speak to them before prior to yes. coming, right? Um, a little bit. <clears throat> they have a, a process. There's no automatic right to appeal. 
with the de deportation. Um, but there is a process that you can take. If you're violating your human rights for argument's sake, you can seek to see if you can get some sort of stake based on that. Or of course, family. To your, you have a right to your family and your private life if it violates that. The thing is this, and it's a moot point at this point, they're Jamaican citizens for argument's sake. Are their rights protected when they land in Jamaica or prior to coming to Jamaica? Have they exhausted everything over there, even through our high commissions? We don't know. So there are a number of ways in which you can deal with it before they come back. And when they arrive, then the senior superintendent will take them from there. Right. Right. But what about when they arrive? Because um, they come, we hear that they're kind of just let go at the airport and there's no structure, no... That, those are some of the stories you've already heard about people leaving with the shirt and then back, them come with one bag. There are some organized well. Yes. Right. So um so there's so we have some persons who come on charter flights. Those are more organized. We have some persons who come in commercial flights. But prior to persons coming, there's a lot of work that goes on between the Ministry of National Security, Ministry of Health, the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs, and, and our um, local systems. So most of the persons who come like on the charter flights, they are picked up on the tarmac at the airport where they are taken to a centralized location where they are processed. Now, there are persons who, will, who, who have left Jamaica from childhood and they really don't have relatives and support here. There are some persons who have support. So once we get the information that they are coming, they're advised. So there are persons here to receive them. Now, for persons who don't have anyone to receive them, there are at least two NGOs that really come in and support them. So they will provide them with meal, they will take their information, whatever belongings they have, and they will provide them with some temporary shelter mm -hmm. and accommodation until they find a way to sort themselves and out. And how, how are they helped to kind of reintegrate into society? Do we have organizations that do that too? NGOs. Help them with skillful employment or anything Pri like that? Well, Pri I don't live in the UK. They are a prize of those organizations okay. uh, that exist. I think I read in the paper, I think it was this morning, that mm -hmm. someone actually walked from that center to Old Harbor. I saw it in the paper. Because they never had anything. Um, oh, Sim wow. used the big word, recidivism. Recidivism. Right, there you go. Um, <laughs> okay. Do you have any numbers on those who would have come back to Jamaica and uh, were falling into well, problems? Yeah, um, we actually, because some of them do, right. and um, because um, we, I looked at some stats between 2017 and 2019, and we see where some 474 persons would have returned to Jamaica and they are involved in. Um, crime and they range from 474, 474 in two years in, in three years. In three years. Well, it's uh, two yes. years because and, we really don't go too and, far. And of that same period, at least 66 of them were victims of, of crime. They were murdered, so murder, murdered or shot. So 470 had caused problems and 66 were killed. Yes, so we find that um, not every single person who is returned to Jamaica, but it's a cycle because invariably a lot of them are returned for drugs and other serious offenses so they follow the network because we have transnational crime where they operate between countries so they will come back and just find a place yeah. to hook up to. Mr. is this ethical? You, you, um, we, we have incredible crime here and then you send back, want of a better word, criminals. I really have no mandate on whether it's ethical or not. Um, what I think should be taken into consideration is that when a person is sent back to a place where they don't know, then do you, you have to take that into consideration. How are you going to deal with that? Especially if you've got a charter of human rights there that speaks to it, and you wouldn't do it in your own country. So having said that, should they be sent back if they, they, they don't know anything about Jamaica? I'm not sure. Depends. You have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, yeah, let's, I think. Let's talk about this. But I want to say one thing just before yes. you go on. What I wanted to say was this. There is a provision that deportees, if they return back to England, they can be redeported under the same deportation order. However, it's quite possible they may not get deported again if their case is reviewed. So sometimes that occurs as but well. But I thought if you were deported, you couldn't go back. Well, sometimes, they sometimes come things back happen. There. Um, Mr. Bassey, do they have access to counsel such as yourself? I mean, there's a young man now who is saying, um, he was among those who came home the other day, says he's ripped from his family, doesn't know what he's gonna do. Um, his wife is there, his kids are there, he's been there, he's grown up there, um, and he would like recourse. I mean, do they have access to counsel? Do they have legal aid so that they can help them to 
to well, fight their cases? If they're making an application to, uh, under, I think it's Article 8, right to family life, they don't have access to legal aid. They don't. However, if they're making an application, I think, under Article 3, which speaks to asylum, then they have access to legal aid. Okay. So okay. May, there may yet be light. Right. Somewhere at the end Thank of you. the tunnel. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney of Law John Bassian, head of the JCF's Corporate Communications Unit, Senior Superintendent Stephanie Lindsay. After the break, conversation flows on water resource management. We'll be right so back. Come.